We are taking a few weeks to take a look at some memes that are created for the purpose of objecting to Christianity. These memes raise some of the most common objections to Christianity, and so we're going to take a look at the logic and facts behind some of the claims that they make. If you don't know what a meme is, in its current form, it can be defined as a humorous image, video, piece of text, etc., that is copied, often with slight variations, and spread rapidly by internet users. And I'll help us out by sharing a few of my uh, most recent favorites. Aiden, if you just put the first one on there, I love this one. I don't like to gossip, but if you have had a conversation, that's how most gossiping conversations start. We'll put the next one on. This is my boys right here. Moms, what was Sunday school about? Eight-year-old dudes, and then it's just four pictures of a guy looking really puzzled. That's exactly what my boys are like every week when they get home. Even my wife has taught the lesson, and they're usually like, Jesus? Yeah, yeah, it's always a safe answer. And then the last one's just a flat-out dad joke. Therapist, your wife says you never buy her flowers. Is that true? Him, to be honest, I never knew she sold flowers. That's pretty fantastic. It'll take you a second, but good stuff. I love memes. I love memes. So, uh... Let's take a look at our next memes that object to Christianity. Let's go ahead and put the next one up there. Thank you. So it says, so out of the thousands of religions that exist, the only one you were exposed to as a child is the only true religion? What an amazing coincidence. Along those same lines, we'll put up the next one from the philosopher Ricky Gervais, who says, there have been nearly 3,000 gods so far, but only yours actually exists. The others are silly made-up nonsense, but not yours. Yours is real. And you may have seen similar quotes or similar memes yourself. There are two points or accusations being made by these memes. Firstly, that if you hold to a religious belief like Christianity, it's probably only because you were raised in a Christian family or a country where Christianity is prevalent. If you'd been raised in India, you'd be a Hindu. If you'd been raised in Afghanistan, you'd be a Muslim. It's got nothing to do with truth. It has to do with the culture and society that you were raised in. That's where your beliefs come from. That's their first claim. Or secondly, the other claim is, how can you possibly believe out of the thousands of gods people believe in that yours is real but theirs is make-believe. How, how can you possibly think that when they all think the same thing? Pluralists, those who believe there are many ways to God, will use this kind of argument to say that it's arrogant to be monotheistic. It's arrogant to believe in only one God and to believe that it's the only way. Atheists like Ricky Gervais will use this argument to point out that your God is clearly make-believe too. So the pluralist will come usually from the angle of how can you be so arrogant to think your way is the only way? And the atheist will come from the angle of saying, well, clearly they're all just make-believe. That's the point. They're both good objections and they're popular objections and they're worth looking at more closely. So that's what we're going to do. Let's take a look at the first claim. The claim that you're only a Christian because of your upbringing. Let's say right off the bat, there's, there's no question that family, culture, and the place we're raised have a profound influence on us. In fact, statistically, it's the number one determiner of a person's religious or spiritual beliefs. But while there are many places that have a majority religion, there are also other facts, like a 2015 Pew Research Center study, which found that 34% of people in the United States, for example, have a belief system now different to the one they were raised in. So it's certainly not a hard and fast rule. While upbringing does play a role in our beliefs, and a significant one is that, it's definitely not an absolute rule. And the evidence for this is everywhere, even in the lives of famous atheists like Richard Dawkins, who did not follow the cultural path of Christianity that was laid out before him in his childhood. So it's easy to prove that this is not an absolute rule, but we all understand that upbringing has a significant influence on people. At a minimum, it increases or decreases the odds that they will adhere to a certain belief system. If you're raised in America, the odds are much higher that you'll be raised Christian than if you're raised in, say, Thailand. But the real problems with this objection are, are logical problems. The argument itself is unsound. And here's the first reason why. When skeptics suggest that all religions are untrue because they're heavily influenced by culture, they're committing an error known as the genetic fallacy. 
This is an error people make when they judge a claim to be true or false on the basis of its origin rather than its merits. So go ahead and write this down. This is a genetic fallacy. That's when you judge a claim to be true or false on the basis of its origin rather than its merits. It's simply a a different version of saying, oh, well, you know, that theory came from a college or a university that's not very prestigious, so it's probably not true, rather than actually evaluating the theory that emerged or any piece of information saying, well, I heard that from so-and-so and and I don't think they're very smart, so let's just dismiss it. You're judging the source of the information, the origin of the information, rather than actually examining the information for itself. In this case, the assumption is that all religions are untrue because they in some way originate from a culture, a person's upbringing. But even in cases where religious belief does originate from one's upbringing, that has nothing to do with whether or not the belief is true. Has nothing to do with it. The truth of any claim about the nature of reality, that's God, us, life, the universe, all that stuff. The truth of any claim about the nature of reality must be evaluated on its own merits, not on the geographic distribution of those who believe it. Even though there are Christians who are only Christians because they were raised as Christians, that doesn't have anything to do with whether or not Christianity is true. It has nothing to do with it. There were centuries where certain parts of the world had the knowledge that the earth was a sphere floating in space, while other parts of the world still believed that the earth was flat and located on things like the back of a giant tortoise. But let me ask you this. Did the fact that for much of history, people had many different beliefs about the nature of the earth, did that fact have any impact at any point on the true nature of the earth. Let me put it to you this way. In other words, we know that the earth is a sphere floating in space. Did people having wrong beliefs about that have any impact on the truth? None, none at all. Before anybody believed the earth was a sphere floating in space, was the earth still a sphere floating in space? Yes. Did that change when there were 10 different beliefs about the nature of the earth? No. Did that fact change when there were 100 different beliefs about the nature of the earth? No. Would it change anything if there were a million different beliefs about the nature of the earth? Wouldn't change anything about what the truth is. The truth would still be the truth. So logically, the belief system you were raised in has no impact on what the truth actually is. That has to be determined by examining the evidence. If I said you only believe what you believe about the earth because of the way you were raised, could that statement be true? Absolutely, it absolutely could be true. But even if it were true, would it automatically make the truth that you were raised in regarding the nature of the earth false? If I said, well, you only believe the earth is a round sphere because that's what you've been taught growing up, that's true. Does that mean that the earth is not a sphere that's floating in space? Of course not. The logic doesn't make any sense. How would you determine that? By examining the evidence. You were raised to believe that two plus two equals four. Because you were raised to believe that, does that mean two plus two is not four? No, not at all. It's a nonsensical argument. Here's my point. If I'm a Christian who was raised in a Christian home, that has no impact on whether or not Christianity is true. It may have an impact and probably does on whether or not I am a Christian, but it has no impact on whether or not Christianity is true. Because if I'm an atheist who is raised in an atheist home, that also has no impact on what the truth is. That also has to be determined by examining the evidence. I'm not a Christian today just because I was raised a Christian. I'm a Christian today because it's true because I've examined the evidence and I'm well informed about other religions and belief systems, including the best arguments for for atheism. But if you were an atheist and you're not acquainted with the best arguments for deism and Christianity, then you are guilty of the same thing that you accuse Christians of, blindly believing what you were likely raised in. Truth is real, whether you were raised in the truth or in a lie, 
has no impact on the fact that there is a truth. It does affect the amount of work you might have to do to find it, but just as we know that we can find the truth about the nature of the earth, regardless of our upbringing, we can find the truth about God regardless of our upbringing. So write this down. Being raised with a certain belief does not make it inherently true or false. That can only be determined by examining the evidence. There are all kinds of beliefs that we have because we were taught them growing up. That doesn't mean they're true or false. It just means it's what we were taught growing up. You got to examine the evidence for yourself in each area to determine whether it's true. Secondly, if it is true that one's upbringing determines one's beliefs, then why wouldn't that same dynamic apply to the atheist? Couldn't I with equal validity accuse the atheist or the pluralist of only being a pluralist or an atheist because of their upbringing? And if, they, if the atheist said, well, if you'd been born to a family in Indonesia, you'd be a Muslim, wouldn't the same be true for him? Wouldn't he be a Muslim instead of an atheist if he had been born to a family in Indonesia? If my Christianity is unreliable simply because I was raised in a Christian family, then wouldn't the atheist perspective be unreliable if he was raised in an atheist family and culture? It doesn't make sense when you apply it both ways. What makes his belief system, which is allegedly the result of his upbringing, more valid than my belief system, which is allegedly the result of my upbringing? You can't say all claims about the nature of reality are socially conditioned, except the one that I'm making right now. That's what we call a self-refuting argument. You see, the logic refutes itself because you can simply turn it around and apply it to the person who's trying to apply it to you. Well, I'm not an atheist because I was raised that way. I'm an atheist because I looked at the information and made an informed decision. Well, if that's possible for you, isn't it possible for the Christian as well? The atheist wants, who uses this objection either doesn't want to acknowledge the impact of their own upbringing on their own belief system, or they want to claim that they are able to objectively evaluate data, but Christians are not. So write this down. The claim that one's beliefs are determined by one's upbringing is self-refuting because the same issues would affect the one making the claim. The same issues would affect the one making the claim. And I don't mean that it never happens. I just mean as an absolute rule there. To claim that that's an absolute rule and that's why you're a Christian, that's why you're this or that, it simply doesn't work because you could turn it around on the person and say, well, then are you not just an atheist because you were raised an atheist? No, I did research. Well, then why can't anybody else do research and come to a different conclusion? Thirdly, logic says that if this were a reasonably reliable rule, if it were mostly true, that one's beliefs are determined by one's culture, and this is a big deal, then how is it possible that Christianity ever managed to grow from one man to the place where today more than two billion people identify as Christians? You can't explain that with birth rate. Neither can you explain the fact that Christianity emerged in Jerusalem and Israel around 2,000 years ago, a time and a place with just about as heavily established a religion as you could possibly have in a place and time. You know, Judaism was it. It was the only show in town at that time. And surrounding Israel were well-established pagan belief systems. And out of that culture and environment, where Christianity should not have spread if it just comes through the culture and through the family, out of that culture and environment, Christianity exploded into the millions in just a few decades. And over the first three centuries of Christianity, the church experienced unprecedented persecution. Christianity grew in the face of the exact opposite of cultural favor. So instead of having a culture and a society that would tend to produce people who are Christians, it was a culture and society that did everything it could to kill and destroy Christianity. It was the definition of countercultural Christianity was. Are you tracking with me here? The emergence of Christianity, the origins of Christianity, inherently disprove this argument. Because if it were true, there wouldn't be two billion Christians on the planet today. 
If everyone just generally believed what they were raised to believe, Christianity would not have been able to grow to the size it is today. And by the way, this continues to happen today in places where it shouldn't based on the culture. China and Iran and Iran are, are witnessing the explosive growth of the Christian church. And these are places where the government is doing everything it can to preserve and promote its own religious culture and stamp out Christianity. Doing everything it can to make it impossible for Christianity to grow, and yet it grows, completely disproving this argument. So write this down. The explosive emergence and growth of Christianity from the first century to places like China and Iran today demonstrably disproves this argument. It demonstrably disproves this argument. To bring it down to the level of the individual, how does one explain the existence then of Christians who were raised to be atheists? Because there are a ton of them. The bottom line is that while upbringing may be the biggest determining factor of what a person believes, it is not a rule. There are millions and millions and millions of exceptions, and it certainly has no impact on what the truth actually is. That must be determined based on the individual merits of each belief system. So if a person ever says to you, well, you're just a Christian because you were raised that way, if you were, you can with good conscience say, well, I think uh, I followed that path and got on that path because I was raised that way. Hopefully you can say, I'm not still a Christian today only because I was raised. I've looked at the evidence. But you can also make the point, the fact that I was raised a Christian has nothing to do with whether or not Christianity is true. That's not an argument against Christianity. It's just an explanation of why I might be a Christian today, why I might have walked that path but you've got to examine the facts if you want to examine the validity of Christianity. So let's take a look at the second claim. Second claim would be, how can you possibly believe that your God is real, but the thousands of other gods are all make-believe? We've got to evaluate this from two different angles because it's used by pluralists and atheists. There's going to be a little crossover, though. As we said, a pluralist is someone who believes in more than one God or more than one way to get to God. Their beliefs are often expressed by something along the lines of uh, there are many ways to get to God like there are many paths up the same mountain or something like that. One of the most famous pluralist analogies is the blind man and the elephant analogy which is very popular with atheists as well. But they like to say basically you imagine there's an elephant in the room and there's four or five blind men and they're trying to describe the elephant to each other and so one touches the trunk and describes the trunk, another touches the tail, describes the tail, another touches the leg, describes the leg, another touches the side and describes the side, and they all give different descriptions. But the point is that it was all really the same thing, it was just a different perspective. And so pluralists love that story because they'll say that's what God is like. All the religions of the world are really describing the same God, the same life force, the same energy or super intelligence from different perspectives. They're just like blind men feeling the elephant. Pluralism is probably the most politically correct system. It doesn't surprise me that it's probably the most popular belief system in Vancouver because it allows you to affirm pretty much everybody's beliefs, even the atheist. Because to the atheist you can say, well, well, being a good person is what's most important. So if you want to avoid offending people, pluralism is a great way to go because you, you never have to offend anyone. You can affirm that what everyone believes is true, which is why this is so popular. It reduces religions to moral teachings. Things like it's just about being a good person, it's just about being kind to one another. And the pluralists will represent this argument that we're talking about right now to make the point, are you really so arrogant as to believe that your belief system is the only correct one? How can you be so arrogant? The accusation being that it is narrow-minded, it's, it's pretentious to believe that you know the truth, but billions of other people are wrong, even though they think they know the truth too. This argument runs into an immediate logical problem, and some of you might have figured this out, or, or you'll know this already, because again, it is self-refuting. Well, how? Because the pluralist believes that it is arrogant for the Christian to claim to have such knowledge about spiritual matters that they can say emphatically, this is the only truth. 
So they say, it's so arrogant for you to think that you have that level of insight, that you could know that. However, the pluralist in making that accusation is in fact demonstrating the exact same level of arrogance by claiming to know that Christianity is not the only truth. How could they know that? Well, they might say to the Christian, how do you know? The exact same question can be asked to them with equal validity. Are they so arrogant as to believe that they can say with certainty that Christianity is not the only way? Even the illustration of the blind man and the elephant backfires on the person who attempts to use it because the illustration is told from the perspective of who? A person who's not blind, right? That's how they know that there's four blind men and an elephant. How can you claim to know that each person only sees part of the elephant unless you're also claiming that you can see the whole elephant, that there is a whole elephant? How could you possibly know that no religion can see the whole truth unless you yourself have the superior, comprehensive knowledge of spiritual reality you just claimed none of the religions have? It doesn't work. So make a note of this. This is a self-refuting argument because it requires the questioner to possess the very knowledge he claims cannot be possessed. It requires the questioner to possess the very knowledge he claims cannot be possessed. The real question is, what reasons do you have for believing your view is correct? We know the world is a sphere floating in space because we can look at the data and didn't just accuse scientists of being arrogant when they made the claim that they had figured out the truth. We would never make any progress if we did that, right? Well, how can you say that the world is a sphere floating in space when there are hundreds of other beliefs in place right now about the nature of reality? Because none of them matter. The only thing that actually matters is what the facts are what the data says, what the evidence says. Everybody has to realize that everybody makes truth claims. The Christian, the pluralist, the atheist, they all make claims about what is true. So it makes no sense to label a person a bigot or narrow-minded simply because they think your, their views are right. Because the other person does too. That's why they're disagreeing. So the person says, well, well you're bigoted. Well, why are they saying that? Because they've made a truth claim and you're disagreeing with them. Everybody makes truth claims. It makes no sense to call one person bigoted because they have a view that's simply different to yours. In response to pluralism, I have to be honest and confess that it's really difficult for me to treat this particular belief system with respect. And I don't mean people. I have lots of friends who are pluralists and I respect them as people, but, but the belief of pluralism is incredibly difficult to respect. And, and the reason I say that is because you can only hold to the belief of pluralism by avoiding learning anything of substance about the world's religions. So it's actually counterintuitive to what you would think. You'd say, well, you know, all religions essentially believe the same thing. You can actually only hold that belief if you avoid learning anything about the world's main religions. That's the only way you can hold that. Why do I say that? Because even a basic surface level investigation of the world's main religions reveals that there are incompatible differences between them. They're mutually exclusive. They're so different that they are actively opposed to one another and cannot both be true at the same time. So for a person to be a pluralist, they have to either knowingly, consciously or unconsciously choose a path of ignorance. That's the only way to hold that belief. And my challenge to a pluralist would be that they've either not examined the basic information or they're willingly ignoring the basic information. Those are the only two explanations. While you may find similarities between certain aspects of religions, they are not significant enough to overcome the massive differences between religions. So in other words, you can't say, well, you know, it says in Christianity that to steal someone's wife is wrong, and it says the same thing in Buddhism. It's not that simple, because when you get into the details, you realize that claiming all religions teach basically the same thing is like claiming that humans and hippos are brothers because they both have legs. There's still a lot of differences there and more than enough differences to conclude that they are completely separate things. 
You can't just say, well, they have legs. I mean, they have skin. They have eyes. I mean, we're, we're basically the same thing. You got to look a little closer. You can't just ignore all the differences because the differences are insurmountable between world religions. And as you go through the world religions and examine their answers to these questions, you find that they're simply incompatible. They cannot be harmonized. Let me tell you what I'm talking about here. Judaism denies that Jesus was the promised Messiah. Christianity affirms that Jesus was the promised Messiah. Complete opposites. Islam affirms that Muhammad was the greatest prophet and that he fulfilled the ministry of Jesus. Christianity denies that Muhammad was even a prophet at all. Christian science denies the reality of sin. Christianity affirms the reality of sin and teaches that it's an eternally significant problem that separates humans from God. Mormonism affirms that there are three separate and distinct divine beings, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Christianity denies the existence of individual, independent, multiple divine beings and emphasizes there is one God who is made up of three persons, the Trinity, completely different. Hinduism affirms a cycle of rebirths, reincarnation, that leads to a person's consciousness being absorbed into God or ultimate reality. Christianity denies reincarnation and teaches that a person has a single life after which he or she will be judged. These are not small differences. You cannot possibly claim that all these different religions are simply different paths up the same mountain. These religions teach completely different things about where we came from, why we're here, the problem of evil, the nature of ultimate reality, and where we're eventually headed. It is impossible for them all to be pointing to the same ultimate truth. In fact, if religious pluralism is true, then Christianity, by implication, must be false because Jesus claimed to be the only way to God. To use our analogy of the nature of the earth, the earth cannot be a sphere floating in space and a flat object on the back of a tortoise. Even though that would be really nice because then you could avoid offending all the different beliefs that people have about the nature of the earth. The differences between religions are equally obvious and equally incompatible. So make a note of this. There are fundamental differences between world religions that are logically irreconcilable. They're logically irreconcilable. You can't logically make them get along with one another. There's no way to do it. So as I said, my, my challenge to any pluralist would be that they either haven't examined the information or they're willfully ignoring it. Because if you just read a basic explanation of beliefs about the world's major religions, you'll see all the problems and the ways that they cannot possibly merge together. Thirdly, it's worth pointing out to the pluralists that their view is guilty of a logical fallacy that we referenced earlier and in our previous message. Write this down and we'll talk about it. Again, the number of differing belief systems does not change the fact that the truth exists. The number of differing belief systems does not change the fact that the truth exists. So when the pluralist says there's thousands of belief systems, how can you be so arrogant to think yours is the right one? The fact that there are thousands has no impact on the fact that there is a right one, that there is a truth. If there's a million wrong theories about how gravity works, that doesn't change the fact that there is a correct theory about how gravity works. How do you find the correct one? Examine the evidence, examine the evidence, examine the evidence. The only thing that the number of differing belief systems affects is the number of people you're going to offend by pointing out the fact that there is one truth. <laughs> Regarding the atheist perspective on this objection, the atheist claim essentially is that the massive number of belief systems that exist around the world proves that religious beliefs are driven by culture and they have nothing to do with the truth. People aren't examining the truth, they're just blindly believing whatever they were raised to believe. There are thousands of religions who think they're right, and so you're clearly deluding yourself by thinking yours is the only one that is correct. Well, we've just pointed out that the number of differing belief systems doesn't change the fact that the truth exists. It has no bearing on the truth. The number of differing views is irrelevant, and it can be determined by evaluating the evidence. But secondly, I could easily flip this question and use the same logic with the atheist. I could easily facetiously say, well, you know, 
the overwhelming majority of the world's population holds some sort of belief in spiritual reality. But you really, you're among the tiny enlightened percentage that's smarter than everybody else and has figured out that there's no spiritual reality. Really, you must be truly exceptional. The atheists would then likely claim that they had evaluated the evidence and that's why they're an atheist. But by doing that, they would be conceding that the number of people who believe differently is irrelevant. And the only thing that matters is the evidence, the data, which again defeats their original argument and claim. So it's a short message today. I'm gonna to wrap up by saying this. L look, at, look at the data. Look at the evidence. And if you get nervous when someone makes a claim, you see a meme, you read an article, actually go and look at the evidence. I'm gonna say this every week. You're never under pressure to provide an immediate answer. It's very rare that an immediate answer is a thoughtful answer. And a thoughtful answer is far more valuable. An informed answer is far more valuable. And you can always tell that person, listen, every objection I've ever had to my faith, every doubt I've ever had, when I've looked into it, I've found a good answer. And so I'm gonna take some time and I'm gonna look into your objection when I find a good answer, I'm gonna come back and share it with you because I don't wanna just make up some silly answer and disrespect you that way. It's hard for a person to argue with a, a gracious answer like that. But evaluate the evidence and come to an informed understanding and you'll find that the truth is always on God's side. Jesus is the way, he's the truth, he's the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. He's the only one who has the power to forgive sins. He's the only one who can fulfill the deepest needs of our souls. And if we look back at the parable of the blind man and the elephant, even if we didn't want to point out the logical fallacy with that, if that were the nature of reality, there would be one thing that could happen in that story that would change everything. And it's this. What if the elephant spoke and told the blind men that he was an elephant and told them exactly what he was like so that they could all hear him? Because that's what God has done. He has spoken. He hasn't left us groping in the dark trying to figure out what he's like. In Hebrews 1, we read this. It's on your outlines. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. We don't need to wonder what God is like because he's revealed himself to us through Jesus. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's the exact representation of what God is like. His character, his beauty, his kindness, his love. That's what God is like. It's Jesus. And he still speaks to us today through his word and through his spirit. And he's available. He's accessible to us right now, right here today. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much that the more we dig into deep questions about the nature of reality and the nature of truth, Father, the, the more we find you in all of them, the more we find good reasons to believe, evidence for your existence, God. And so I thank you that we don't have to be plagued by the thought in the back of our mind that we're gonna find some piece of information that's gonna prove you're not real. That's not going to happen. And Father, I, I pray that we have all had, and even this evening we'll all have an experience with you and with your presence. But I thank you that in moments of difficulty, we don't have to rely on an experience. We can rely on what we know to be true based upon fact, based upon reason, based upon logic. So Father, I pray that we will just take advantage of the fact that you have spoken and that you continue to speak, Lord by your word and by your spirit. And we ask that you would speak to us tonight anything that you need us to hear, anything that you would want us to hear from you, Lord. Would you open our ears to hear what you would say to us, God? We ask that you'd meet every need represented in this room. 
that you would encourage where encouragement is needed. You'd give energy where energy is needed. Grace where grace is needed. Peace where peace is needed. Hope and joy where those are needed, Lord. We just confess that everything that we truly need is found in you. You are our source. You are our provider of every good thing. And so we love you for it and we look to you for it, Jesus.